Welcome to the Religion Story Podcast. On this week's episode, we are going to talk about the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. It's probably something that is new for many of our listeners, but the themes and the ideas behind it are something that you're probably familiar with and is something that is very useful for Bible study. So, to explain more about what is the Wesleyan Quadrilateral and how it can potentially affect our faith, Dana, let me throw it over to you. So, uh, I can already expect that there's going to be a lot of mispronunciation of quadrilateral tonight. I don't think I talk slow enough to get it right every time. Um, but the quadrilateral is, uh, is an idea that is supposed to be found in the work of Charles Wesley, um, a major figure in the Methodist movement, founder of the Methodist movement. Um, it, it's not actually a coin or a term ever coined by him. Uh, but a lot of people see it in his work. And the idea behind the Wesleyan quadrilateral is that there are four uh, foundations of knowledge, four ways that we are able to form theology and church doctrine. Um, and they are the following, scripture or revelation, church tradition, experience, personal experience, and reason. Or logic. Um, so the quadrilateral is this idea that there, um, you can think of it as a, a square or rectangle, but sometimes people really like the, the idea of a trapezoid um, with a, a base that's larger than all the other sides of the trapezoid. And that base is scripture. Um, and then you have these other four um, things, tradition, personal experience, and reason. And Together, all of those help us to uh, understand the faith, to form theology, and to know, to know what's what. Um, so these are really important and fundamental for everything that we do in Christianity. But uh, Stephen, we were talking beforehand, you were saying that some of these are maybe more important than others. What, what are your thoughts on that? Right, so we'll start with saying the common order that most churches, evangelical churches, will put these in would be scripture first, uh, because they believe that is how God revealed his revelation uh, or the Christian beliefs of uh, faith that you're going to have. Uh, then you'll have your tradition, mainly church traditions that have been passed off uh, the go-to example for these would be the early church. We want to follow their example, um, where some might argue that the early church didn't do everything right, and so they wouldn't necessarily be the go-to example for how we're supposed to do things. Um, and some will say they live and die by how the early church did things. The whole restoration movement is kind of based on that, where churches of Christ have, uh, have a little bit of their roots as well. Um, then you have uh, commonly, uh, because Daniel, I know you mentioned experience next when you were listing them off, but reason for, for the most part uh, comes in the third place. So you have uh, your reason, reasoning. An example I might throw out just off the top of my head would be uh, if you were trying to decide the age of accountability, and I'm using air quotes there, that's just a common uh, term that is tossed around the age of Stephen. Uh, this is a video podcast. You can use real air quotes. There you go. Okay. The age of accountability. What does that mean? And if you're using reason uh, by just your observations that uh, children at a certain age know what they're doing and can be held accountable for their actions. That is not something that's talked about in scripture. It's not a tradition that's passed down. It's just using your uh, common knowledge, uh, just of how people develop their thought patterns. Uh, and then experience is knowing the, the, the knowledge that you get from the other three. How have, what is your experience? What has moved you or um, uh, what direction are you going based upon uh, the type of uh, interaction that you've had with faith, other people, etc. And so that's the, just the common order that most churches would have them. With the caveat, uh, not all of them have that order. 
For example, the Catholic Church places tradition on the same level as scripture. But there are many other variations of how people can put these. So uh, let's, let's get into that. Let's talk about what other examples or churches or religious groups uh, might differ from the, the norm. Stephen, you, you might uh, argue with me on this, and, and please feel free to. Would the Catholic Church put tradition on the same level of Scripture because they believe that their tradition is in line with Scripture? Yeah, they do believe in the apostolic succession of well, the Pope, obviously, believing that he is a direct line of his, uh, the apostles uh, taught uh, the next people in the order of the church, uh, how the church should be ran. And so unless you are ordained through those apostles, through their bishops in the church, then you are not part of the church. Um, and so having said that, they believe that their tradition is coming down from a line that has been handed off from uh, one generation to the next um, through the church. Okay. Well, th I, th I, I wanted you to clarify that. Thank you. That, that's interesting. Um, so I, th I think another reason to look at it in the order that Stephen presented it is this, that first of all, scripture is preeminent. It is, it is first. It is, it is God's revelation to man. Um, and if, if you don't agree with that, um, I don't know why you're listening to this podcast. Perhaps you need to go back to season one and, and start over. Uh, think we've covered that before, but uh, that's agreed upon by most Christians. But the ordering of the next three, I think, has to do with uh, the, the broadness of the base of who you share those things with. For example, when we're talking about tradition, we're talking about uh, the hundreds within a congregation, the, the thousands of a community, the millions of Christians uh, who who have a similar tradition. So you have this broad base that you're able to share your tradition with. So tradition has to be ranked fairly high. Uh, reasoning, you know, come let us reason together. Reasoning is a public experience, but on a smaller scale than what happens in tradition. Uh, so our reasoning is something that we do together. You know, we, we talk about things, we, we try to come to an understanding about something. Whereas experience is an individual, an individual experience, for lack of a better word. And because it's, it's done at the individual level, it is important for our own interpretation of scripture, but scriptural interpretation needs to be done in community. So reason and tradition have a, a bit of a leg up on experience. And just to show you that there are different ways that religious groups are going with this, experience is really taking a high seat in uh, the modern church where uh, people want to join a church that is going to give them the experience they desire. Now, how does that fit in with the, uh, scripture and commands that we find in that? That's a topic for another day. Um, so the reason could also trump tradition. I think that's how the Reformation got its entire founding. Uh, Martin Luther said, okay, I see what your traditions are, and they've been around a while, but they are totally missing the point. And so Martin Luther comes along, nails some papers to a door, and says, this is the reason that I have, and your tradition does not line up with it. And so you, there's an example of how uh, reason would jump the ladder and be over tradition. Uh, Daniel, I wanted to ask you, but I, I can see you got some thoughts running through your head. I want you to, after you share your thoughts, can you uh, maybe walk us through uh, prima scripture and sola scripture? Uh, but go ahead and share your thoughts. Yeah, I, I do really want to talk about those and how those relate to the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Um, but yeah, first, I, I wanted to say, uh, akin to what you were just saying, Stephen, as maybe a defense of another approach. Um, and I don't want to go too far into this because this is our podcast dedicated to the quadrilateral. But um, William Abraham, the, the guy that I wrote my thesis on, he, uh, he's a Methodist, um, but he's not a huge fan of the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And I'm not sure if this is exactly why, but I, I imagine this is his explanation. 
um, he says that there are means of knowledge um, or criterion, or you would use a, a, a epistemological uh, foundations, a lot of different words he would use to describe the same thing. He would essentially say there are things that are true and there are things that are false. Um, and there are ways that we know those things that are true and false. And they can't be um, better or more true or more false than another. Um, but I, and this is, this is starting to get into my own sort of thoughts on this, moving away from him. Um, some of them may uh, be easier to navigate or to interpret than others. Um, so, uh, um, so he would say, not scripture. Scripture is not a means of knowledge or uh, um, a, an epistemological foundation, but revelation is, and that's what scripture is supposed to contain, right? So revelation can tell us things that are true, and if we believe revelation is from God, then it is uh, perfectly true and cannot be wrong. There's no reason and experience tradition those can't uh, I want to they, repeat the last thing you said. I don't know if it froze up for you, Michael, but I, I missed that for about 20 seconds. We can good. Little Rock. It's it's not as uh, technically savvy as Austin and Nashville. Um, basically, what I was saying is that revelation um, is a is a means of knowledge. If revelation tells us that something, if God has told us that something is true, it obviously must be true. Um, uh, but if reason also told us that something is true or something is false, it must be that um, that way. Uh, the problem comes in in finding what does reason really say, and that's why there are uh, thousands and thousands of mathematicians and philosophers who deal with this sort of stuff every day, and they disagree because even reason is hard to navigate sometimes. The same could be said for scripture. Scripture revelation is always true, but we have to find revelation in scripture. And this may not apply to our podcast, but certainly there are a lot of people who say um, the relationship between scripture and revelation is not one to one. There, it's more difficult, and you have to find the revelation in scripture. Mm -hmm. um, all that to say, to Stephen's point, there's another. That's another approach for saying, okay, reason. Really, maybe all three or all, or all four are on the same threshold. I personally would put reason and scripture a little bit higher up than um, tradition and then finally experience. Uh, but did, did that make sense? I know that, that was a little bit technical. Um, was that that follow at least what how some people might make that argument? I um, think so. So let, let's move to something a little bit more fun. Uh, so two... Latin phrases that, uh, the first one, I assume our listeners have probably heard at some point in their lives, the phrase sola scriptura. And then the second one is prima scriptura, which is a phrase that was really developed sort of in contrast to sola scriptura. Sola scriptura means scripture alone, um, or uh, you sola, solitary, uh, solely. So that is a, a slogan that's often associated with the Reformation. It's the idea that our, um, our doctrine, our theology, our faith is based on scripture alone. And that, like Stephen and Michael have been talking about, that was sort of to, to separate the Reformation from the Catholics who held tradition in very high regard. Um, I, I would say that on par with scripture for our, our purposes. Um, uh, so that, that's been a big part of the Protestant movement and Christianity for the last 500 years. Now, prima scriptura is the idea, uh, similar to what we said before, that scripture is foremost in our development of theology and in our faith, um, but it is not the only thing that helps us um, develop the, the Christian religion. Um, so with those two ideas, prima scriptura versus sola scriptura, what, what do y'all think about those? Do you think one is better than the other? Um, prima scriptura obviously seems a little bit more in line with the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Does that, does that make it more tempting to y'all or do you, do you like the Protestant slogan, sola scriptura? I'll start and say that, uh, initially I, I, I was thinking that I am a proponent of prima scripture, but with, I have to put it with the caveat that, uh, tradition, 
needs to line up with scripture. Reason needs to line up with scripture and your experience needs to line up with scripture. And so with that framework, it really goes back to the soul of scripture. Everything is reliant and dependent upon uh, the scripture. And if it does not uh, jive with it, then it doesn't, you cannot uh, use that reason. You can't use that tradition. Um, and so as much as I th thought I wanted to uh, adapt to a prima scripture type of theology, I think I, I end up falling back on the soul of scripture. Yeah, okay. So uh, I think I would use similar reasoning to what Stephen said, but I kind of come out on the other side. And let me let me say why. So um, I was raised on sola scriptura. Uh, that's that's always been kind of in the the dialogue. It's always been part of the the terminology that uh, the congregations that us as a family have have been a part of. Um, and I, I think it's important to recognize that sola scriptura is making this basic claim that everything you need for salvation, everything you need to be a child of God is found in scripture, scripture alone. You don't need anything else. Uh, you, you don't need outside books. You don't need outside knowledge. You don't need tradition passed down by men. All you need is scripture. Uh, and so reading your Bible is, is important. Uh, learning, learning to understand what God is telling us through his word is important. That's right. However, where I think prima scriptura becomes important is realizing that while salvation is first and foremost, we are called to live a complete life uh, filled with interacting with other Christians, filled with uh, the sanctification process of becoming um, a, a more complete person in Christ. And when you think about all of the things that we are called to as Christians, sola scriptura gets us so far, but then there start to be questions where scripture is not clear, uh, where scripture gives basic principles, but then you have to reason your way to, well, what does that mean uh, for me today? I um, figured you were going to go with that, and that's almost... Uh to quote the uh, president slick Willie saying that depends on what your definition of is, is. And then like, okay, of course you need to be able to uh, communicate and understand the language and use reasoning to decipher what is trying to be communicated through scripture. But is assuming you know what a language is and you can uh, communicate with what the scripture is telling you, then that is the reasoning. I'm, we're, we're talking about outside reasoning out of what the Bible is telling you. So how are you going to separate that from, uh, from Scripture, uh, outside reasoning? Does that make so, sense? Can, well, can you, can you uh, talk a little more? What do you mean by outside reasoning? Do you mean reasoning that is, uh, is against Scripture or reasoning that is just neither neither positive nor negative in accordance with scripture. you're talking about uh scripture everything that you need to know for uh, to be a christian a follower of christ to know how to be saved uh you have to have outside reasoning outside of scripture to come to that conclusion and i don't think you do and so but uh i think what you're trying to get as like for example uh, abortion. If you're trying to come up with what side of the fence uh, do I need to be on for that, and you need to look at uh, experience and uh, reasoning of what a child's life is, and um, and when does a life begin, things like that. Yeah, you're using reasoning there, but what does that necessarily have to do with salvation? And I think that there's enough uh, things in Scripture that can lead you to a logical conclusion on that. Some people are going to differ, uh, but I think as far as salvation is concerned, everything you need to know uh, is found in Scripture. It, it, and I, I apologize if I if I didn't say this correctly. I, I agree with what you just said, that for matters of salvation, sola scriptura, it's all you need. But the Christian life is more than that. There is, there is more to the Christian life, uh, the 
decisions that we make every day as being a part of God's church that require us to make decisions that go beyond what is simply stated in scripture, in my personal life, in my church life, in talking with coworkers about my faith. Um, I'm, I'm asked questions where there's not a book chapter and verse that directly addresses each question. Now there's, there's broad overlying principles that I can use to apply. And I use my reason. I use tradition. I use my experience to, to try to tell this person about my faith uh, or to try to interact with a, a Christian brother or sister. Okay. So it, it's, it is still scripture as the informing narrative of all of the other, uh, to use a big word, epistemological tools. But um, I think when we say sola scriptura, we negate the importance of these other decisions. So if we're saying all we care about is salvation and sola scriptura, but if we're saying that there are other decisions that are important than prima scriptura. Right. So, um, for example, and I don't want to take all of our time here, so Daniel, please chime in. Um, and where where would somebody come to the conclusion that they need to have a more liberating view of Scripture versus a conservative view of Scripture? That is something that the Bible doesn't direct us on. Um, some might argue, because I think that it kind of does in some ways, where we have examples of being radical Christians and taking uh, extreme measures to make sure that we are following God and going uh, above and beyond to do things God has commanded us to do, where um, it's becoming more and more common in the church today to have a relaxed, um, uh, non-confrontational uh, approach to being a Christian, where you don't want to be up in somebody's face because that's not effective uh, as far as uh, converting people to Christ. In some ways, that's right. But what urgency are we then taking to uh, bring people in that are lost? So you got to balance it out in some ways. But I do think that the Bible does speak to um, radical living and in some ways conservative living where you want to make sure that you're as far away from Satan as possible. Yeah, to, to sort of speak to our listeners at this point, um, if following Michael and Stephen's conversation, uh, you may have caught on to the idea, this is some of the fundamental problems with the Wesleyan quadrilateral is that uh, it doesn't really capture exactly how, um, how learning and knowledge works. You can't easily break it down into these four categories. Reason, for instance, uh, what is reason really describing here? And is reason not, uh, is reason not instrumental in how we uh, read scripture, which y'all were talking about? Is it not instrumental in how we interpret tradition? Uh, reason in some ways seems like it's very fundamental to how we experience everything. Um, and so then you have a gray line between what is experience and reason. So that, th those are some of the problems here. And then I think y'all are, Y'all are getting, y'all are, um, by uh, performing surgery on these ideas, y'all have sort of brought out these, these difficulties of dividing it into these four categories. Stephen? Would it be beneficial for us to kind of talk about how Wesley uh, came up with um, these four sources of information? Uh, because reason and experience are come from within they're yourself but it's also an influence of the environment that you're in and so he stole that from uh, I'm sure it came from uh, the um, the Greek uh, age with Socrates that they person yeah uh, I'm sure that was stolen from them but when you also want to uh, then measure what the environment is giving you they have identified that scripture and tradition are the two main sources for uh the religious beliefs that are being imposed on people not imposed but um, those are the influences of the environment and so you're taking the balance of what is coming from within versus what is part of your environment and how are they blended together and so that's where he's coming from 
with saying you got your reason, your experience, and then um, you have something that is above you, your scripture, at least in Wesley's view. Obviously, we've already discussed some people don't believe that. And then you have your tradition. The, that is the other source of information that you have here. Um, and personally, I'm kind of surprised that Wesley even put tradition as the second thing. I think it was just the uh, large influence of the Catholic Church at that time, even though it was in the middle of the Reformation movement. And what was the result of Wesley's teachings? Uh, that the people that were followers of Wesley then were labeled as Methodists, which was a derogatory term for those people. Uh, they just later adapted it because it stuck. Um, but yeah, that was not his intention to gain a following and have a church that uh, kind of went off of his teachings. No one ever does. To be, if you if you don't have an insulting name as your church title, you're not trying hard enough. Uh, to be clear, again, uh, Wesley did not come up with the four categories. Those are just uh, themes that come out of his work. Someone else came up with the four categories. Reading. Well, he grouped them together. Um, so, uh, I, I think I think it would it would be I th I think it's useful for me to to think about some of the ways where tradition, reason, and experience are good things, and some of the ways that they're not as good. Um, do, do you mind if I just do a little quick bit uh, on some of these? So, for example, with tradition, one that we've already noticed is the Reformation was a response to, tr to tradition going back up to scripture and saying, all right, here's what scripture says, Here how it, here is how it contradicts uh, tradition. So let's start a new tradition. Let's start a new way of doing things, which now we as Protestants have uh, 400, 500 years to draw upon there. Um, a good side of tradition would be our style of preaching. Uh, there's There's, we could go to scripture and say, oh, it's supposed to be done like this, or it's supposed to be done like this. Um, and we could have disagreements there, but we look back on tradition and there seems to be a more settled way going all the way back to John Christosom in the 300s, 400s and saying, okay, this, there is a tradition of preaching that we have and the way that that is done. Um, reason, uh, I think one, one of my favorite examples I'll do this one really quickly uh, that Tim Keller gives is that your reason uh, needs to be informed by scripture. Um, for example, a thousand years ago, maybe 2000 years ago, let's say that there was a man who struggled with bloodlust and also struggled with homosexuality. At the time, they, uh, the general society would have condemned him for his homosexuality, but not for his bloodlust. His warrior spirit would have been commended. In today's society, Let's say that there's still a man who struggles with bloodlust and homosexuality. Society would condemn him for his for his warmongering, but they would be accepting of his homosexuality. Reason changes across time, but scripture uh, is preeminent. Scripture is something that stays consistent on these issues. So we see that a reason that is informed by scripture is something that has credence when we're talking about these issues. If we allow God to change our reasoning, uh, then our reasoning is powerful uh, towards interpreting scripture. Uh, the experience is one that is, you know, it's, it's difficult to say, well, this experience is good or this experience is bad, but the experience, uh, once again, needs to be informed by scripture. And so, I know that if I, uh, if I see God in nature, if I, experience, uh, if I experience God working in this world, if I'm truly experiencing God, that is something that can give me confidence in him. Whereas an experience that is so divorced from Christ is so removed from his work in my life that I don't experience him at all. That's not something we can trust because we have removed ourselves uh, from what it truly means uh, to be in Christ. And anyway, um, that's my quick way of saying that with all three of these, there there's a way for them to be informed by Scripture and a way for them to get away from Scripture. So, um, 
I'll talk. I'll, I'll give uh, some thoughts on the three of them as well. The the three beyond scripture. Um, I'll start with scripture actually. So with scripture, uh, I think in my I I, I attend a, a Church of Christ and. It, many ways it, it bears a lot of uh, similarities to y'all's um, congregations that y'all attend. Um, but a lot of my time is spent um, reading and socializing with people who would fall into a very liberal um, form of Christianity. And I sympathize with that a lot. Um, but a, a major uh, issue, I would say, or reoccurring phenomenon in liberal Christianity is a movement away from uh, dependence on scripture. And, and again, I think there's uh, maybe a case you can make for that. But at the, at the same time, when you do that, you lose your identity as a Christian. Our whole faith is a faith built out of a, a single book um, and these sacred Text. That's where um, the identity of all Christians have come from, um, sort of in parallel with the Lord's Supper and uh, baptism. Uh, but in, even beyond those two, Scripture has held this preeminent position, and I think that we, we lose a great deal in, in the liberal side of Christianity when we begin to move away from that. Uh, regarding the other three, uh, just briefly, I think tradition is very important. In fact, I think it's seeing a, a resurgence in a lot of our churches as Protestantism 500 years ago sort of pushed us away from the need to emphasize Christian tradition. I think a lot of conservative and evangelical churches are starting to realize again, okay, there's a lot of rich material in the, these 2,000 years of church history before us. Um, especially in the work of the patristics and the church fathers. Um, and I think that's really good that we recapture that. Uh, regarding reason, uh, y'all have already heard me speak on reason a few times tonight, that I, I think reason is, is very important in our Christianity. And I, I might even push back against a little bit of what Michael said, that I, th I think we need to not neglect our own uh, logic and reasonable faculties when we are interpreting the Bible, when we're thinking about serious theological issues. So, um, so can I, let me interrupt. Um, how, did, how did you understand me saying that we should reject our reason faculties? Um, so one, I'm glad you interrupted me because I didn't really have anything for experience. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, you certainly didn't think that you certainly didn't say that we should reject those things. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, a re recurring thought uh, that I've heard from a lot of people, and I think, um, Michael, you would say this, is that when it looks like scripture and reason are in tension or in contradiction, that we should assume that God's ways are higher than our ways, and our reason is wrong, and scripture is right. Um, I would push back against that to say it's not necessarily the opposite, but um, it is very much possible that we have misinterpreted scripture. Um, so can I, can I twist your words a little bit I, I, or twist them for the better? Um, am I accurate in saying that you're, you're saying that it's not scripture versus reason, but it's um, our reasoning about scripture versus what scripture actually means in some cases that we could say that scripture means something when scripture would say, wait, I never meant that at all. So the scripture is still the, the, and it's the high priority for us. It's just yes. the reasoning was flawed. Yeah. I, I think I would agree with what y'all are saying um, to, to the threshold or to the extent um or j just before you get to inerrancy. Um, I think we've talked about that before, uh, that I, I, I wouldn't prescribe to an infallibility of the biblical text. Um, but just short of that, yeah, um, I think what y'all are saying is correct. Stephen, what, what are your thoughts on these categories? Or you can respond to 
for what we were just talking about? Um, as far as the categories go, uh, since I'm, I lean towards the soul of scripture, because I think that the rest of your decision making does, uh, needs to be informed by um, uh, the scripture. Uh, I do think that reason would probably come in a second for me because uh, your reasoning can, uh, w in line with scripture, can better tell you what tradition would be than what has just been handed down. Uh, but for the sake of um, the early church's example, uh, I do think that in areas that we just don't know one way from the other, if uh, the church decided that they were going to do something and it seems correct and it falls within your reason, then why not do it? Um, and, and if your experience then also lines up with that, then yes, then you would want to follow tradition. And I think that's really, um, that's really just using the I ideas of what the Reformation was. Um, the reason didn't line up with the tradition when you put both of them uh, up against what scripture says. And so they said the traditions just aren't working for us. So we're not going to do them anymore. That was when they decided to break away from the tradition. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I would say scripture top followed by reason uh, and tradition would then come next and experience um, possibly over tradition as well. But uh, that's just me. So there's one other idea that we wanted to bring up, uh, and I, I think we're getting close to the end here. There is another popular uh, way of interpreting scripture, and specifically within Churches of Christ, uh, that it's the shorthand is uh, command, uh, example, necessary inference, or even shorter, CENI, C-E-N-I. So you look to the commands of Scripture, the examples as, as set forward in Scripture, and then the necessary inference when the first two don't spell it out clearly for you. Um, and if I'm interpreting this correctly, guys, correct me if, if y'all think I'm wrong, um, command and example would both be within Scripture, and then uh, necessary inference is reason but also in some ways, the necessary inference is looking on the tradition of what God's people have always done and saying, okay, here, here is the necessary inference that people have made before. Um, so in some ways, you're looking at their reasoning from the past, but it allows you to, uh, to reason within a community, which I think is what tradition is. Um, guys, do you all see the, that way of viewing scripture as similar to the Wesleyan quadrilateral? Um, yeah, it's definitely, there's, there's a reason it's associated with the uh, Churches of Christ, Stone Campbell movement, and that's because it, it is clearly focused on one of those, uh, one of those points on the quadrilateral scripture. Um, I think you're right, I think you're, uh, what you were saying, Michael, is fair, that yeah, you could maybe make a case for the, the necessary inference uh, paralleling reason and to a lesser extent tradition and uh, experience. Um, but yeah, it, it's maybe if you took that model and you gave it to Campbell and he shaped it around one of those points, he kind of crunched up your quadrilateral and said, here's your quadrilateral uh, yeah. in scripture. Um, then yeah, I, I can see how these are competing methodologies. Stephen agrees. I concur. Well, uh, I think we're probably running out of time. Um, why don't we go for one more quick, uh, we'll all say one more quick thing to end off. Um, Daniel, you got 30 seconds. What's, what's a parting thought that someone should have at the end of this discussion? The Wesleyan quadrilateral is uh, this really interesting idea if you are interested in uh, the study of revelation and interpretation and uh, again that big word we've been using epistemology. If those things interest you this is a fantastic uh, entry point into those subjects which gets you into a lot of fun 
theology and formation of doctrine. So it's really worth checking out. And as always, the Wikipedia page filled with great information on this topic. Stephen, do you have any parting thoughts? Yeah, uh, I would say that uh, this is just something, a, a good tool to use to find out where did your beliefs come from and why do you believe the things that you do? How much of it comes from scripture? How much of it is influenced by uh, your own reasoning? And has your reasoning been tainted by uh, something from an external environment that has not been uh, reconciled with scripture? And if all, if all your beliefs can be reconciled with scripture, then I think you're in the clear. Um, it, that's just something that, uh, you have to really nail down and, and figure out where are my beliefs coming from? What are, what types of reasoning, uh, am I using external sources for? And like I said, I, I'm a proponent for sola scriptura, but, um, uh, I'm sure you guys might have a little bit differ, uh, differing opinion on how to examine what your beliefs are. So in um, my last 30 seconds, while uh, all three of us would probably, you know, hot, hold scripture at a very high place, <clears throat> we all uh, allow, rely on our own reasoning uh, a good bit. Um, I want to challenge myself and to challenge listeners uh, to think about tradition. Uh, tradition can often be a four-letter word. It's like, oh, that's, we just do that because of a tradition. And it's actually a way to dismiss something. Uh, rather than taking the challenge of Wesley, uh, when, he, when he wrote, it was 1,700 years of church history. For us, it's 2,000 years of church history. And for us to ask ourselves the question, um, given that I believe that my practices are in line with Scripture, what then does, does tradition have to say about it? Because when I rely on tradition, yes, as a secondary source, but still as a source, I allow myself to be, uh, to use the language of Hebrews, in a great cloud of witnesses, to, to read scripture with those who have gone before me, and to form my own traditions, which will go on to generations after us. So don't dog on tradition. Tradition can be a good thing. Don't let it rule your life, but do let it inform you. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and end this episode of the Religion and Story podcast. Thanks for listening or watching. And uh, if you like what you hear, subscribe to the podcast, leave us a rating, tell us what you think, give us future ideas for topics, and we'll talk to you next week.